All right. We're going to talk some about throttle body. <laughs> Throttles. Why do we need the blade? Throttle blade regulates the air volume, the atmosphere pushing into the cylinder. There's a 10 question test at the end. Make sure you get an answer sheet and have something to write with. Um, in the old days, there was a venturi above the throttle blade. And when air went through there, that low pressure that was created would pull fuel out of there, it would atomize it, and the throttle plate was down here. That old meter was just there. All right, so the choke plate, when it was closed, riches the mixture by cutting off some of the air. And the rich mixture required for cold engine starts and to keep a cold engine running. On your fuel injected engine, you got a rich mixture when it's cold too. And the throttle valve connected to the linkage to the accelerator pedal controls the amount of air fuel mixture entering the engine, and by controlling the fuel, uh, the flow rate, the throttle valve will determine engine speed. Now, a diesel, you basically just regulate fuel, and the more fuel you put in there, the more power and the faster it runs and all that. Now, additional fuel delivered when the throttle is open is going to unite with oxygen. That means it burns. And that heats up the inert nitrogen, creates a powerfully expanding gas, and it shoves the piston down, and the throttle plate directly controls the power output of the engine. So where's the front of the engine in that illustration? Can you tell me? What's the front of the engine in that? Now I'm talking about an engine that's obviously in there like that Pathfinder you're working on. Which way if you're standing in front of a, a vehicle looking at the engine, does the engine turn? Clockwise? Hmm? Clockwise? Clockwise when you're looking at it. When you're sitting in the vehicle, it's, it's counterclockwise. Clockwise. Okay, so remember that. So when you're, you're looking at your balancer, it's going to be turning this way, right? For you before top dead center, top dead center, after top dead center. All right. So morphing technology, you know, points ignition morphed into electronic ignition and fuel delivery change of venturi delivery to electronic injection. The old system accelerator pedal linkage and throttle plate turned into electronic throttle control. Uh, now, this is what you got down here, uh, electronic throttle control. It's got a little motor on the side of it. And, you know, you, you basically went from points to electronic, which I've got a whole board over here that illustrates that. And then you've got your carburetor, and then you've had your, your throttle cable. Incidentally, I don't know if you've ever noticed it or not, but some of these throttle bodies have got a set of ball joints on them and stuff, like what that Bronco does out there. And whenever you open the throttle, uh, that little bit of linkage is set up so that the throttle plates will open evenly at an even speed. Because if you just hooked them on there the wrong way, you see a lot of times they'll have it curled over this pulley thing so that when you're applying the throttle, it won't start opening slow and pick up speed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A lot of times you wouldn't even think about needing to do that. But that's largely why they have that little pulley thing for opening the throttle, like that right there. When the fuel injection has to be an engine controller making decisions, and some of them related to the choice of the driver, some do other things. I do, uh, what two things do I not need if I've got electronic throttle control? What two pieces of hardware do I not need? I do not need idle air control or idle speed control. That's done by the throttle body. I do not need a cruise control servo. That's done by the throttle body. You got that? So the cruise control is built into the engine control. My 07 F-150, when I bought it, was a plain old, plain Jane truck. It had electronic throttle body on it. And I said, well, I want to put cruise control on this truck. And I like having cruise control. And the way that I did it was I bought that $52 set of cruise control switches took the steering wheel off, mounted them on there, plugged them in, because there was a place to plug them in, went in there with the IDS, told it I had cruise control, you know, what screen to go to, and I had cruise control. The little green light comes on the dash and everything. <laughs> you know, there's not a kit that you can buy from Ford Parts and Accessories to put cruise control on an 07 F-150, because it's got electronic throttle body and cruise control already built into the engine controller. The only thing you had to have was, you know, more. What were you seeing? Did you see somebody out there? Oh, you were pointing out there, I thought. Okay. Anyway, when the vehicles first started, the driver doesn't have to do anything. Now, that's the way it was with idle air control. Uh, the air, idle air control opens all the way up, and the injectors pulse to wet the manifold like the old accelerator pumps once did. If the IEC doesn't open for some reason and the injector don't double pulse, it'll, it'll start hard. The engine still needs what it always needed extra fuel and extra air at cold start. 
All right. A key on, the engine controller gathers data from the barometric pressure sensor, coolant and air temperature, closed throttle position voltage, which is stored for that entire engine cycle. And if any of those inputs don't line up with reality, there's going to be a problem. All right. So in a lot of the old idle air controls with a stepper motor in there, look at that. I actually got a yellow piece of text here that you can't even read because that, that slide was a different color before. All right, so this little stepper motor here has basically got several terminals here, and I'm typically, and there's two different ways to use them, but imagine if you got a stepper motor that's got one hot and three grounds, and the three grounds go like that, and they turn this little nut that runs that plunger in and out. And those are steps, and it can stop that plunger anywhere it wants it to be. That's why you're supposed to be able to go in there with your idle air control, look at it with your scan tool and see how many steps it is. If you've got an air leak and it's trying to idle too fast, it'll have zero steps, but the engine will be idling, you know. And what I used to do if I had one that was idling too fast and I wanted to see if it was being pulled through the idle air control or if it was leaking from somewhere else, I would take the air inlet tube off and just cover up the throttle body with my hand. If it tried to suck my hand in there and it killed the engine, I know everything was going in through the throttle body. If I cover it up and it stays alive and it's still kind of running fast, I know air is coming from somewhere else. That ain't complicated. I may put a bug like that on there for you. Okay, forward out air control valve. This right here has got the stepper motor. The forward out air control valve, basically had two wires going to it, and it would increase the amperage to this winding to pull that against the spring. That's what it is. That's what's on this motor up here. All right, so that's not too terrible. If the AC is on or the steering wheel is turned, the speed will increase. Uh, you know, when you turn the wheel all the way and the power steering pressure switch closes, it'll kick the idle speed up to, so that it won't idle too low. Um, how much pressure does the power steering pump put out when you're turning the wheels all the way? That's not any piece of information you usually have, is it? About 1,200 pounds, 15 maybe, tops. All right, when the throttle begins to open, the PCM monitors the amount and speed of throttle opening and adds some extra injector pulses, expands the, because that's your, that's your accelerator pump, Expands the injector pulse up with something based on engine load. Why do many throttle plates have a small hole in them right here? What's that hole in there for? <laughs> it kind of helps it, huh? To equalize the pressure or something. Well, that's not a bad thought. I mean, you're thinking clearly. If that throttle body gets all clogged up with crud, then it'll still idle because it's got a hole there so we get, some can get through. It's not totally shutting off the air okay. if it gets clogged up. You see what I mean? That's my idea about it. Now, somebody else may know more than I do about that, but I noticed in throttle, when the throttle body started having holes in them, you know, like somebody figured out that it also keeps it from going from no air to air and making it, you know, fall on its face, too. I mean, it's part of that. Electronic throttle control was first used in the vehicle in 1986. And they were limited by cost, so only high-performance vehicles with traction control were equipped with that system. As a matter of fact, uh, I've got back there somewhere a, uh, a guy that, uh, I mean, a uh, electronic throttle body that this guy, there's a guy from Russia that, uh, about your age, uh, named Alex, and he brought his car in here and he said that he had replaced all these parts because it was running really rich. And one of the parts he replaced was electronic throttle body because it had two throttle plates. And if you get to spin in the wheels too much on that SC300, it would close that, it looked like a choke almost, it closed the throttle plate so that it was in control of how much throttle you were able to give it. It was a different throttle plate than your other one, you know. But anyway, uh, Lincolns did that too, on their, on their Mark uh, 8, they did that too. Uh, they had electronically controlled choke type throttle plate above the throttle. See, you got a throttle plate down there and another one up here. And it basically would do that as a part of your traction control. Uh, if you got a rambunctious driver spinning the wheels, you know. So less hardware needed but more software. Eliminates the hardware needed for idle speed control and cruise. I talked about that earlier. If the PCM can control the throttle plate, it can handle either function as a part of its own algorithms. Now our here, accelerator pedal position sensor, uh, the fly-by-wire system been in place on aircraft since the 1970s. So uh, necessity redundant sensors provide a higher level of reliability. So they put more than one sensor on there. You know, aircraft have got, even passenger aircraft have got uh, typically uh, like two or three sets of hydraulics, you know. So if one of them gets damaged or whatever, they, you still got control and everything. The driver is just determined by putting a sensor in the accelerator pedal. PCM uses that to determine what to do with the throttle blade. Now, this thing has really got to know 
there's another sensor with on the throttle body. So the throttle, you got a feedback from here, and it knows, wants to know what you're doing here. And so uh, there's a motor on the throttle body that it, it uses to open and close the throttle plate. Now, the spring is not what closes the throttle plate. Okay? The engine controller pulses current in there to close that throttle plate. If you happen to be in a situation which you, where you put your finger in there with the engine running, and that thing wants to close that throttle plate, it cuts your finger off just about. So be really careful about that. And when you're cleaning a throttle body that's electric, don't open it with your finger. Because occasionally on some cars, if you open it with your finger, suddenly you don't have a good throttle body anymore, and that's four hundred dollars. See where I'm going with that? All right. Now redundancy for safety dictates there will be more than one sensor on the accelerator pedal, but the sensors, while sitting in pedal movement position, aren't the same voltage. Some systems have only two sensors on the pedal, some have three. This right here is kind of like what you can look at on some of them. You notice this was 0.75 to 4.29, and this was 4.29 to 2.98, and that's 3.98 to 3.20. <laughs> now, why they're all over the map like that, I don't know. I guess the, uh, they wanted it probably to be that way in case some of these wires got shorted to each other or something. I don't know. But uh, oh, like on this uh, Miss Goosby's uh, Ford 500, the sensors on that are mirror images of each other. And uh, so they're, I mean, it's just, it's a different thing. All right, so the, the two sensor systems vary in their part, you know. The waveform here is the throttle moving from idle to wide open throttle and back to idle. Right here, Ooh, like that, you see how that? Now these two signals, when you combine, the PCM calculates the average, which allows the pedal position to be calculated with greater accuracy. The old 73 power stroke diesels had one potentiometer and an idle validation switch. The idle validation switch is totally different than idle. The idle validation switch went bad or something wrong with that sensor, the engine wouldn't do anything but idle. It sits there, oh, we can give it the gas all you want. And we used to have to put those uh, pedals assemblies on there. And besides that, they don't want you just putting the sensors on the pedal. They built the daggum pedal and they want to, you know, have it set up for their pedal. Now, these uh, accelerator pedal position sensor outputs are from a 2005 Altima. You see, and your TPS on your throttle body is basically responding to what these are doing, which is a pretty cool little thing. That shows the throttle moving from idle to wide open throttle and back to idle, and these signals when you combine allows it to calculate the two signals. See that? Yeah, you know that? You got uh, APPS here, here, and you got two TPSs here. And so uh, that TPS signal on the throttle body is, is also a redundant signal, and they got to agree that the throttle plate is moving. Anything's out of line on that, you don't go nowhere, or you only get half throttle. The wrench light on some vehicles comes on when it needs an oil change. On some of your Fords, it comes on when there's something wrong with the electronic throttle body system. And Ms. Goody's wrench light would come on, she'd only have half throttle because she had a wire that was short. Now. GM started using electronic throttle body on a lot of pickups and SUVs about 2000, but the existing Delphi controller wasn't fast enough to provide a reliable throttle opening with the current output, so they actually put a throttle actuator control module and it's mounted over there where the cruise control box used to be under the hood of the Chevrolet pickup truck. All right, so that was uh, basically the throttle actuator control module is set up like this, you know, this is this from the cruise control schematics. They, they would basically take cruise control information and use that uh, in addition to what it's getting from the accelerator pedal and then there's a powertrain control module. That's serial data right there, which is basically a network line to the engine controller. And you notice it had three throttle position, I mean accelerator pedal position sensors too. Well Ford faced the same problem and they got a black oak processor that was adopted to handle these necessary higher necessary speeds and Ford's ETC came later than GM's for that reason. And that's kind of what that looks like here, you know, from your, this is going into your PCM, you know, there's your AC high pressure switch on that one, of course it takes input from that too, which causes the electronic throttle for, to respond to AC clutch operation and your TP uh, sensor out there. Uh, who's going to do that? So, anyway, you can see how all that's lined up. You got to kind of know both of them. When a concern's present, it'll either illuminate a wrench light or a throttle body warning light. You ever seen a light like that on one? It's got a lightning bolt between there. Uh, and the text capable clusters may spell out a warning that there's reduced power and the throttle will either only open halfway or not at all. These Chevys actually will say on the little, you know, uh, screen and all that what's going on there. Um, in order to hold a throttle blade at one position, current's pulsed at about a thousand hertz. 
a hertz. One hertz is one time a second. A thousand hertz is a thousand times a second. And with this fast current pulse, the magnetic field is retained rather than failing between the pulses. So it allows for the motor to hold the throttle blade steady without movement. That way it can move it smoothly, see? Everything is digital. You knew that, didn't you? Even when you move your arm, that's a digital movement. It's broken down a lot of little small movements. That's called quantum mechanics. You ever heard of that? You ever heard of quantum mechanics? I know you have because you're a math nut. Okay, so what we got here is we've got uh, quantum mechanics and particle physics and all that stuff is not what we're about, so we're going to move on. Okay. Normal mode. This mode is selected at power up and will remain active until a problem is detected. Once a problem is detected, appropriate action will be taken. Limit performance mode is activated when the driver intent cannot accurately be determined or when the output of the engine power is impaired. Like for example, if the engine can't pull good because of the, for whatever reason, you know, something's choking it down or whatever, like maybe your exhaust is stopped up, maximum power is lowered and throttle plate to slow slow and a warning lamp is activated. Forced idle mode. When no driver intent's available, it don't even know what's going on. You give it a gas and it can't tell you're doing nothing. It basically is uh, like if you disconnected or there's a wire cut or no or no data is present, it'll start and run but won't respond to the switch. You know it's slightly different from one vehicle to the next, but they're all going to have some variation of this. Power management. That's activated when the ECT system can't reliably control the engine power using the throttle. The throttle is disabled so it can return to the default position. It is spring loaded, but like I say, the engine controller closes that during normal operation with the same pulses that it opens it with. Uh, now, it's uh, control using fuel and spark only. That way, that is generally caused by an inability to position the throttle blade to the command value or a complete loss of TPS information has occurred. Back in the uh, late 90s, there was uh, some Mitsubishi Chrysler cars, you know, that had what they call fuzzy logic. You ever put your cruise control on when you're going up a hill? And you really don't want it downshifting, but it downshifts because it's trying to hold the speed, and you don't really want it to do that, and it irritates you. Well, what the uh, <clears throat> fuzzy logic did was that they said, well, we know that we would ordinarily downshift going up the hill, but since this guy's got cruise control on, he probably doesn't want that to happen, so let's not downshift this time. <laughs> they called it fuzzy logic. I mean, it didn't always work the same way, but it, it was factoring in what it felt like you wanted, you know. And they were doing that in the late 90s, you know, some of the, not on every vehicle, but on some of them. And a lot of them, too, whenever the transmission shifts, it will detorque the engine so you barely feel the transmission shift at all. You know, if you watch that happen. But anyway, engine shutdown is activated when the ETC system is unable to process the control algorithms, cannot control the engine power. And that's generally caused by an internal processing problem or the inability of the intake air system to throttle body to restrict engine airflow. If it's got a big air leak, it's causing it to try to run away. It'll shut the motor off because they don't want you to crash and burn. All right, wild card question number one. Get your paper ready. The washer around the face of some spark plugs is there for the primary purpose of doing what? A, preventing compression loss. B, conducting heat out of the spark plug. C, placing the spark plug fire and electrode at the proper depth. Or D, keeping moisture out of the cylinder. You have five seconds. Four, three. These tests are a learning operation, aren't they? Answer it. You can do it. Even if the toe adjustment is correct, a vehicle will generally pull toward the side with the most blank camber and most blank caster. Positive, negative, positive, positive, negative, 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 positive. Which of those is right? And that takes some thinking there, right? This is tough stuff, isn't it? If you haven't been taught this, you're not going to know the right answer anyway. Technician A says positive temperature coefficient sensor, uh, thermistors increase their resistance as the temperature increases. Technician B says as the temperature decreases, negative coefficient uh, temperature coefficient thermistors reduce their resistance. Who's correct about that? In other words, they say that they decrease their resistance with increased temperature. 
if they're negative temperature coefficient. Make sure the wording was right on that. A banjo bolt fitting such as the fluid connection to a brake caliper uses what? A hollow bolt and two copper washers, a solid bolt and one copper washer, a tapered bolt and three O-rings, an inverted flare nut with a Fibonacci pitch on the threads for strength. You know about Fibonacci, don't you? What's a banjo bolt? Banjo bolt's the one that uh, where your brake fluid goes into the caliper. That Fibonacci pitch is pretty important. Isn't it? Which sensor or circuit is not checked continuously on an OBT2 system? TP sensor, MAP sensor, ECT sensor, O2 sensor, heaters. In other words, you got continuous monitors and you got some where certain conditions have to be met before it can check it. Right? Non wideband oxygen sensors don't work until they reach 600, the system is in closed loop, torque converter is locked, or the engine coolant reaches 200 degrees Fahrenheit, or whatever that is in Celsius. I try to put Celsius in here a lot. The difference between an alternator and a generator on a late model vehicle is A, a generator has an internal regulator and a dash mounted warning lamp. B, an alternator is controlled by the PCM. C, an alternator is driven by the same belts as the water pump. Or D, a generator's output is PCM controlled. Now there's some arguments about this, but I put the question up there anyway just so we can stir up some trouble. Mm -hmm. Every now and then I'll throw something in there or say something a little bit wrong so some YouTube subscriber will send me a nasty grim. <laughs> There's a lot of people watching these things, you know. The difference between a PCM and an ECM is what? A, the PCM controls the alternator. B, the ECM controls the engine but not the transmission. C, the PCM controls the engine and the transmission, or both B and C. Ding, 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 ding. Which of the following would not be considered a computer input? Throttle position sensor, magnetic pulse generator, part neutral switch, or EGR bit solenoid. Think about it. Next question in five, four, three, two, one. All modern engine gasoline powered passenger cars have some type of what system? PCV, EGR, AIR, or heated hydrocarbon vent? All right, now we back up. Raise your own test. What's this washer there for? Somebody tell me. Conducting heat out of the spark yeah. plug. B. That should be Bravo. Conducts heat out of the spark plug. It's also that tapered seat does the same thing on the ones that have a tapered seat. Even if the toe adjustment is correct, it's going to pull toward the side with the most positive camber, that's with the wheel leaning out, and the most negative caster, that's with the... So that's A, right? Yeah, that's going to be positive camber and negative caster. Technician A says positive temperature coefficient thermistors increase. Yep, he's right. Technician B says the, the temperature decreases, negative temp coefficient of temperatures reduce their resistance. No, actually whenever the temperature increases, negative temperature coefficient this thermistors reduce their resistance. That should be A only on that one. Banjo bolt is basically a hollow bolt and two copper washers. And of course it's got the little banjo fitting in there. Which sensor or circuits check, not check continuously? O2 sensor heaters. They won't check those all the time. But it's always looking at this, it's always looking at that, it's always looking at that. That's continuous monitor versus, you know, having to do drive cycles. As a matter of fact, the, uh, some of the old uh, Jeeps and stuff, the Chrysler stuff, would check the uh, heaters in the middle of the night when you were sleeping. That engine girl would wake up, 
I've been sitting here a while. I think I'll check those uh, O2 sensor heaters and then fire those bad boys up and watch for that voltage to drop. And let, <laughs> you know, watch for five volts down. And you know, you didn't even know it was doing it. It's spooky. Uh, not one. It, it, imagine that if you crawl up under somebody's jeep in the middle of the night and they ain't been out with and you touch the oxygen sensor and it burns you. Ow! Why is that hot? You know, you can see where that went around. Uh, non wideband oxygen sensor didn't work until they reached 600 degrees Fahrenheit. They got to reach 600 degrees. Because I don't even know what that is in Celsius, but I bet a manual could do it in his head. All right, the difference between an alternator and a generator, this was me talking here, and this is what I, J1930 regulation changed the terminology of a lot of stuff. Everybody had to call their sensors all the same names, you know. But uh, I noticed that about that time they started calling the alternator a generator. Well, back in the day, the generator was an old round one that was about as long as they had before they had alternators back in the early 60s. Anyway, it always seemed to me like a generator's output's PCM controlled. But the people at Visteon, they rebuild alternators and stuff. I wrote an article for them one time. They said, we're going to call this an alternator. We don't care what anybody else calls it. <laughs> but it's not, a, it's not part of the J1930 regulation. But it, this, this changed names about the time J1930 came out. For a difference between a PCM and an ECM is uh, B and C. The ECM controls the engine but not the transmission. That's what you're going to see on Duramax diesel, some of them. And the PCM controls the engine and the transmission. Yeah, that's both B and C. Uh, which of the following would not be considered a computer input? EGR event solenoid is an output. A solenoid is an output, not an input. That's going to be D. All modern gasoline-powered uh, passenger cars have some kind of PCV system. You won't find EGR on every car. You won't find an air injection reactor system on every car. And a heated hydrocarbon vent is something I made up. There's no such thing. So it's going to be the A. You're going to have a PCV system. Is everybody happy?